Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities. Tonight on NJTV News, New Jersey's ready for its close-up. We're on the set of NBC's new series, and the governor says this is the first production here in New Jersey since the tax credit was signed back into law. How do you define clean energy, and how do we get to 100% renewables by 2050? The BPU is taking input. A New Jersey company launches a software program to help end the cycle of addiction. Plus, undecided senators reveal their intended yeas and nays on the next Supreme Court justice nominee. Those stories are more next on NJTV News. Live from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at Two Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us. Lights, camera, income. A new law is making the state a big draw for primetime television and film production companies that are shooting shows, spreading wealth, and creating jobs in Jersey. But not everyone's giving it rave reviews. Leah Mishkin reports. In a quiet suburban area of Creskill, New Jersey, are signs pointing you to the set of NBC Universal's show The Enemy Within. It's the first production to begin filming in the state since the Garden State Film and Digital Media Jobs Act was renewed in July. Warner Brothers movie The Joker is also currently filming in Jersey City and Newark. Storefronts and venues like the Paramount Theater are getting a Gotham makeover. Welcome to New Jersey, where film production is back and doing well. From 2006 to 2016, a beginner $10 million a year tax credit program was in place, but industry officials say money eventually ran out. When it came time to renew the program, former Governor Chris Christie vetoed it, saying it was a, quote, expensive bill that offers a dubious return for the state in the form of jobs and economic impact. We really haven't had an economic incentive of that kind, uh, and our neighboring states all have them. The executive director of the New Jersey Motion Picture and Television Commission, Stephen Gorelick, says now with the new $75 million a year program, which is set to last five years, dozens and dozens of companies are reaching out. A company here working in North Jersey would get a 30% tax credit for all their qualified New Jersey expenses. If they're in South Jersey, certain counties, you can get up to 35%. Uh, so that's that's the program. It's a, it's, a, it's a very attractive program to the industry. The governor says that means an economic boost for the state. He pointed to the enemy within as an example, explaining the production is expected to spend over $50 million and bring in 300 jobs to New Jersey. The cast and crew will be catered by local restaurants and visit local stores, supporting small businesses right here in this community. And finally, I believe when people see us on their TV screens at home it will, or in the movies, it will encourage them to want to come and see us for themselves. But critics of the tax incentive program say the benefits won't outweigh the costs, while the Office of Legislative Services says it can't predict how much revenue the tax incentives will generate. It does believe they will have a negative fiscal net impact, estimating it could cost the state up to $425 million all in all. When the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, a nonpartisan research and policy institute, looked at the Massachusetts tax credit program, it found the bulk of the economic benefits go to non-residents, and most of the jobs created are only part-time. It's not just bringing film and television projects, and they're, they're kind of the hook, and what we're doing is bringing in bricks and, mor bricks and mortar businesses. Yesterday, I uh, had a meeting with a visual effects company that m wants to move to the state. Uh, we've been talking to studio uh, developers who may want to come here, uh, equipment houses, uh, prop houses, that sort of thing. Those are permanent, uh, permanent businesses, permanent jobs. So it's all about that as well. Just this week, Jam Room Communications announced the opening of an audio and voice production studio in Howell. Leia Mishkin, NJTV News. Judge Brett Kavanaugh's confirmation to the Supreme Court is all but certain. Key swing senators, Republican Susan Collins of Maine and Democrat Joe Manchin of West Virginia, say they'll vote yes tomorrow, forecasting a final tally of 51 votes for confirmation and 49 against. The final Senate vote scheduled for tomorrow afternoon will bring an end to the most divisive confirmation fight in decades.
Supreme Court Justices Sonia Sotomayor and Elena Kagan are capping an all-day conference celebrating the women of Princeton. Raven Santana is at the She Roars event. Raven? Mary Alice, the three-day event focuses on connecting, empowering, and celebrating women of Princeton University. This is the second ever She Roars conference with over 90 events and more than 200 presenters, but all eyes will be on this evening's discussion here at the gymnasium where Supreme Court Justices Elena Kagan and Sonia Sotomayor will be speaking. Now, graduates I spoke with say they are eager to hear what their fellow alumni think of the controversial confirmation process of Judge Kavanaugh. Honestly, I think part of the buzz for today is with this evening what conversations, what discussions might be had around that process and also recognizing and respecting the fact that these two women are on the court. So being cognizant of there may not be a lot that they can possibly say and respecting that. Well, I think in this particular moment to be with wonderful, brilliant, assertive, accomplished women is feeling very consoling um, uh, at a time that is not has not been inspiring for us as a country and as a democracy. I think it's it's like really good to have this right now because you're building on all this momentum and discussion and it's always surreal when you hear women talk about those stories and it's like okay it's still happening and I, it's sad but it's the reality. And both women and men I spoke with had a lot to say when I asked them about Judge Kavanaugh's testimony. I think it's amazing that he's still being considered um, given the outburst that he had, um, and that's awesome. I hope that I, too, on my next job interview, are, am able to have such an outburst and still get the job. I certainly feel that, that uh, this process has been expedited and pushed way beyond the, the bounds of reason. I personally feel that um, there's a lot more exploration and digging that has to be done, and then the answers need to come out, okay? Uh, but this is not the way to do it. With the big decision just around the corner, alumni say they are eager to hear what the Supreme Court justices have to say, if anything, this evening at Princeton University, Raven Santana and JTV News. Thanks, Raven. Taxes on corporations have the attention of Jersey companies. Here with all the day's business news is Rhonda Schaffler. Rhonda? Mary Alice, Governor Murphy earlier this week outlined his ideas to promote growth in New Jersey's economy, but his latest move is drawing sharp criticism from the state's largest business groups. Late yesterday, the governor signed a bill that tweaks the state's corporate business tax. Business leaders don't like a provision that would change the way income earned overseas is taxed. The New Jersey Business and Industry Association says that added tax would put a significant additional financial burden on large companies as well as discourage startups. Even Governor Murphy admitted the change may disproportionately impact certain New Jersey taxpayers and said the state would monitor that. The New Jersey Chamber of Commerce says it believes this issue is far from over. Meantime, get ready to pay more if you shop online. Governor Murphy has signed a bill that would allow online sellers on platforms like eBay, Etsy and Amazon to collect sales taxes in New Jersey. And the governor also signed a bill that reduces licensing requirements for hair braiders in the state, reducing the amount of their training hours and expenses. Today, the governor signed an executive order establishing what's being called the Future of Work Task Force. That's something that was included in his economic development plan unveiled on Monday. The task force will look at how technology and innovation will impact job growth and the state's economy. The state's manufacturing sector is finding it hard to fill open jobs right now. That's what business leaders heard at the 7th annual Made in New Jersey Manufacturing Day, which was held in Somerset. And JBIA President Michelle Sakurka said the state currently has 40,000 vacant mid-level manufacturing jobs. The U.S. unemployment rate has now dropped to 3.7 percent. The last time it was that low... Richard Nixon was in the White House, and Neil Armstrong was taking one giant leap for mankind. The year, of course, 1969. Unemployment fell to a near 49-year low in September, according to the government's monthly jobs report. Now, despite that drop, the number of new jobs created lagged behind forecasts, with companies hiring 134,000 workers last month. 
Turning to our retail roundup for this week, a new Trader Joe's apparently coming to Cherry Hill. While the company won't confirm that, local officials say the store will open in Town Place at Garden State Park. It would be the 14th Trader Joe's in the state. And Hamilton Township in Mercer County has been selected for the first ever location of an indoor entertainment complex known as All Play USA. The company said it considered locations from New York to Philadelphia before settling on Central Jersey. Down session on Wall Street this Friday. The Dow dropped 180 points. And those are your top business stories. New Jersey's commuters woke up to another messed up morning commute after the train derailment NJ Transit called Minor caused major misery last night. While the exact cause of the derailment remains under investigation, transportation officials say a soon-to-be-released audit of NJ Transit will recommend how to fix its operational problems, and Governor Murphy added punch to that promise. If people are upset about it, I don't blame them. And obviously, safety is our first responsibility and, uh, and, and otherwise delivering on-time acceptable service. Uh, and this incident violates all of the above. For all the headaches and all the challenges and the mess that we inherited, this is fixable, and it will be fixed. And it will be fixed not tomorrow, but sooner than later. A new stone amphitheater drew a crowd to Patterson Great Falls National Historic Park. It's the centerpiece of a more than $3 million renovation to enhance the falls where Alexander Hamilton launched America's Industrial Revolution. Representative Bill Pascrell spoke at the unveiling. This view is reminiscent of the one that Alexander Hamilton had when he conceived and implemented his plan to harness the force of water. Look at that, force today. God was good to us. So let me tell you, look at that water coming over that ball today. The state's proposed energy master plan to make New Jersey clean, green, and sustainable has generated so much interest that state working groups have added extra hearings to enlist ideas from the public. Brianna Venosi reports on the latest meeting to address peril and promise the challenge of climate change. If the state intends to reach 100 percent clean energy by 2050, environmentalists see a glaring hurdle. The most important thing you can do in terms of steps um, is this moratorium on any new approvals of fossil fuel in infrastructure. We need a, a moratorium on, on new fossil fuel projects. I'm joining others who have asked you for a full moratorium on all fossil fuel infrastructures and projects. This latest meeting of the New Jersey Energy Master Plan Committee in Newark was a catch-all, asking for general public input to help draft a new plan by June of 2019. We really want to put together a plan that's comprehensive and that is thoughtful and thorough. Ideas run the gamut, but many here agree the focus should be on reducing emissions that contribute to climate change. When you approve new gas pipelines, when you approve new compressor stations, when you approve the expansion of compressor stations, when you improve, approve all of this type of infrastructure, you're making things worse, not better. Attendees asked the committee, made up of members from the Board of Public Utilities, to rethink state projects with environmental impact as a whole system instead of individually. For instance, seven pipeline projects, three new natural gas plants, or Governor Murphy's new law that gives $300 million a year over the next 10 to boost nuclear power and generate approximately 40 percent of the state's electricity. It is less important when we get to 100 percent and more important what we do in the next 10 years. Um, if we don't start to, to begin a dramatic drawdown of greenhouse gas emissions in the next 10 years, we will have missed the window of opportunity. In our master plan for New Jersey, we have to deal with the reality that the federal government is rolling back safety standards. The EPA under President Trump has moved to reverse dozens of environmental standards, including emission standards for cars and coal-fueled power plants and withdrawing from the Paris Climate Accords, to name a few. Now, as we move towards a zero emission vehicles, that should include our public modes of transportation, our, our ride shares, our public fleets, as well as our personal vehicles. That's critical to addressing 
climate change and global warming. Kim Gotti with Clean Water Action says that's particularly important for areas like Newark, where roughly 3,500 of the 14,000 trucks heading to the ports travel through local streets, leaving residents with the aftermath, pollution, asthma, dirty air. We are disproportionately polluted upon because of the zip code we reside in and the color of our skin. One additional meeting will be held October 10th. Anyone with comments can continue submitting those until 5 p.m. October 12th. After that, it's in the hands of the committee. In Newark, Brianna Venosi, NJTV News. New Jerseyans fared better financially in 2017 than the year before, but Census Bureau data show income inequality remained virtually unchanged, and the data suggests the gap between rich and poor has a racial component. The median net worth for New Jersey's white families is more than $271,000. It's about $7,000 for Latino families, for black families, just $5,900. New Jersey Institute for Social Justice Executive Director Ryan Haygood put that on the record with Chief Political Correspondent Michael Aaron. It's a staggering number, and it really is surrounded by a number of other statistics in New Jersey that make New Jersey one of the leading states for having racial disparities. So that statistic, as you mentioned, comes from the economic justice context. But it's also true that New Jersey has some of the highest black to white youth incarceration disparity rates. So in New Jersey, a black child is 30 times more likely to be incarcerated than a white child, even though black and white kids commit most offenses at about the same rate. You can watch Michael's entire interview Saturday evening at 6.30 and again Sunday morning at 10.30. A crash course in Civics 101. That tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, May's Landing, where Oak Crest High School students who may have been intimidated by the voting process or unaware of the monumental impact it can have, got a leg up on elections. Their history teacher, Vince Serra, who's also a councilman in Brigantine, hosted a campaign convention at Election Drive to demystify voter registration and even the voting booth. He got an assist from local candidates and representatives from the County Board of Elections and the League of Women Voters, one of whom said only 46% of eligible voters under 30 actually exercise the privilege. Mr. Sarah says the recent political environment has students, quote, more engaged than they've ever been. Next to Jersey City, engaging the public with art. The 28th annual Jersey City Art and Studio Tour kicked off inside JCAST headquarters at the newly acquired Pathside Building in Journal Square. JCAST spreads out all over town occupying more than 150 art spaces throughout the city, and curated tours will hop stop along the route where nearly a thousand local and regional artists will display their visual art, music, performances, and films. Finally, Ventnor, where a long dormant deco movie palace is getting a rebirth and maybe even a bar. The last of Epsican Island's old movie theaters was in an advanced state of decay, but the bones are still strong. The new owners plan to keep the original deco ceiling tiles inside and copper pediments outside and paint the exterior and historic burgundy with gold lintel trim. The interior decor will be speakeasy chic. When the building reopens by Easter in the North Beach section, it'll sport three screens, one near IMAX sized, bars, and a restaurant upstairs with New Orleans style seating along a balcony extended the length of the building overlooking the Wawa. And that's the Garden State Express for Friday, October 5th. Something up in your neighborhood? Tip us off. Support for the Environment Report provided by PSE&G, making things more sustainable for New Jersey. As recent polls show diminishing daylight between long-serving U.S. Senator Bob Menendez and Celgene Executive Bob Hugan, each campaign has unleashed harsh ads attacking the character of the other. Both candidates joined State of Affairs with Steve Adubato, who pressed them for answers on some of the criticisms leveled against them. Donald Trump, 
Yeah. How much money did you contribute to Donald Trump when he was running in 2016? And if you contributed that much, what did you see in him as a leader that caused you to say, yeah, he's the right person I, to lead our nation? I did contribute to the Republican Party primarily was my contribution. What, what I saw in 2016... But you gave to him as well. I, yes, but the majority of my contribution to the Republican Party to support the general election. <clears throat> what I saw in Washington in 2016 was we were stagnating, and it was not good. It needed disruption. Well, unfortunately, we now have dysfunction. Could you understand a significant number of New Jersey and saying, I don't know if I trust Bob Menendez? Well, Steve, look, a couple things. First of all, as you noted, a federal judge exonerated us of the most significant charges. Uh, t 11 out of 13 jurors of average New Jerseyans said we don't believe in the government's case, and several of them severely criticized the government for even bringing the case. And then a Republican Department of Justice uh, ultimately dropped everything. You can watch State of Affairs in its entirety this weekend, twice on Saturday and twice on Sunday. And next week, NJTV kicks off the Wednesday debate series with candidates for the 11th Congressional District. You can watch live on air or online from 8 o'clock to 930. Support for the Medical Report is provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. People struggling to free themselves from addiction may find a sobriety companion in the palm of their hands, delivered to their smartphone by a man who knows the courage it takes to remain in recovery. Michael Hill has this new tool to help tackle New Jersey's drug addiction crisis. 28 years ago, I crawled into uh, a treatment center myself uh, on my hands and knees, and my life wasn't working. 28 years later, Brian McAllister is still in recovery. The best-selling author and founder of this wellness center says he's taken what he's learned and put it in this interactive online guide called Freedom 365 Virtual Recovery System. It is the first virtual recovery system. Part of the issue with recovery now is only 4% of the population has the type of insurance that will allow them to get treatment. The 4% that needed it, at least 96% of the population needing addiction treatment with no way to address this, this life-altering disease. McAllister says Freedom 365 does not replace calling 911 for emergency help and does not replace treatment. He says it's meant to support treatment and aftercare. You can get it on your phone. You can get it on your uh, PC, you can get it on your tablet, and 24-7, 365 days a year, you have interactive recovery content and a, a whole suite of tools that was designed to really help interrupt a negative thinking pattern, keep people sober, keep them from relapsing, and help them achieve their potential. The first time you view the homepage for the day, you will be asked if you stayed sober for the past 24 hours. McAllister says the program takes advantage of technological advancements, is HIPAA compliant, is encrypted and confidential, takes subscribers at first on a 28-day journey that tests their compliance and encourages them to set goals and take action. McAllister says the program forces those who use it to be honest with themselves and about where they are on their road to recovery. The more honest and fearless you are when completing the action plan, the better the results. It's almost like a gamification. It encourages use. It makes it fun. It can't be preachy. Nobody could have made me get sober. I had to want it. And this makes people want to want it. Whenever you find yourself thinking of taking a drink or a drug, click on this item. The empowerment page contains three levels of solutions. McAllister launched Freedom 365 this summer. He says it's catching the eye of major American companies looking for innovations in treatment. A serious health concern, but some humor to sum up some reaction. My partner Steve always says, it will ruin your drinking and drugging. You'll know too much. You can't hide behind ignorance anymore. You will be relate If you have this issue, if you have this disease that I have, which is known as drug and alcohol addiction, you will recognize yourself in here. But it will also give you solutions, fun solutions, enjoyable solutions. It can't be punitive. It can't be something that you have to do. It's got to be something you want. In Fairfield, Michael Hill, NJTV News.
And now some noteworthy facts that help you know Jersey. Federal data indicate nearly 75% of the state's renewable electricity came from solar power in 2017. Census data shows 46% of 18 to 29 year olds voted in New Jersey in 2012. Both Supreme Court Ju Associate Justices, Elena Kagan and Sonia Sotomayor, are graduates of Princeton University. And in 1942, 23 women were admitted to a government sponsored summer course at Princeton. University on photogrammetry. If there's someone you'd like to get to know Jersey, share. Use hashtag no Jersey tomorrow. Don't forget, next week on NJTV, Michael Aaron moderates the first in our series of Wednesday debates. Candidates vying for the 11th Congressional District face off live on the air or online Wednesday at 8. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thanks for being here. Have a good weekend. WJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Lead funding for Peril and Promise is provided by Dr. P. Roy Vagalos and Diana T. Vagalos. Major support is provided by the Mark Haas Foundation and Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III.